Hello, I'm George Lau. You've met my wife, Marty, I think, the basket weaver. And I'm a potter, and this is some of the work that, some of the old pieces that I've got. I've been a potter for, looks like, since 1974, so 46 years and counting. And uh, still can't wait to make the next piece. Um, and really old piece that's from my college days. It's kind of fun to look back and see some of the old pieces and look. This one was been made in 1975. And then um, some pieces that from graduate school. Look, this kind of thick slip. Some pieces from uh, when I was teaching in Florida and uh, the Challenger, we watched the Challenger blow up and so I was influenced by uh, all the fragments of that and so I made lots of pots that were with fragments and um, I've, I've always loved English pottery and some of the uh, paintings on the pottery and uh, I love old crockery and so here's a, a piece from several years ago I painted with birds and flowers and uh, it's kind of fun. A piece just a kind of historical blue spongeware people love blue and uh, so I've made lots of different kinds of pottery through the years. I guess the main emphasis is on useful utilitarian pottery that's bowls and cups and plates and pitchers, things that can be used and incorporated into the kitchen that we can eat off of and celebrate the meal. All right, so how about we go into my studio now and take a look around there. So now after all of these years and all the different kinds of pottery styles I have um, made, um, now I just enjoy making very simple, humble, kind of earthy colored glazes and uh, little cups and bowls. Like a small little drinking cup for me can be one of the most exciting shapes that I make. Just some small little thing that I might use and reach for in the cupboard. And um, I enjoy that maybe more than a great big piece like this that is just purely decorative and it sits in the corner maybe gets dusty where a little cup that I use every day goes in and out of the kitchen in and, in and out, I don't know, the in and out of the dishwasher and uh, and in and out of the cupboard and I love, although I make so many things that are similar, each one to me is very different. And um, depending on how I glaze it or how it turns out. And um, just something as simple as a little pitcher which is sitting there waiting to be filled up and, and used to pour water into a cup. And lidded pieces are pretty fun because they always invite me to come and pick it up, pick the top off and look inside. And so then you're interacting with the piece. Simple jar. And I make lots of dinnerware plates. It's a pretty low profile piece but um, we eat our meals off of plates and so it's always nice to have your own collection of handmade, hand thrown plates. One of the things I do quite a bit is I can't hardly resist making a piece. First it's round and then I kind of squish it, flatten it into a, an oval shape. And for me that gives me a, a better view of, of the piece where uh, a rounded shape can turn out a view so quickly when it's been flattened. And you can see a little bit more of the surface maybe and, and what the glaze is doing. Here's a box of little cups, but each one, even though they're so similar, when I look at it close up, 
each one has so much detail I think um, that's when I'm really happy with the pieces that maybe it evokes a landscape maybe it looks like it's carved out of wood or metal but um, I love it when the glaze begins to show a, a bit of the the extreme heat that it had to endure in the kiln and the glaze begins to kind of move and run and and the layers of glaze is kind of interacting with one another so each cup that I love this little cup kind of has a little dance about it and then uh, well the next one I like so yeah they're all the same glaze combination but for me they're all unique and different for me the most exciting time is actually seeing the piece finished coming out of a kiln and seeing it for the first time so here's some pieces that I haven't even seen before it's a fresh batch of pots and let's see what Wow so much fun to see these pieces when they're for the first time it's like a work through all these stages of making them and finally when they come out of the kiln and they're finished they're they reveal their completed form and they're good to last for a long long time into the future but to see them for the first time it's so exciting. I guess that's what makes it all worthwhile for me is working towards this end goal of of seeing them finished. It's like Christmas and each piece is different. Alright so this is how it starts. A bag of clay. It's about 25 pounds of clay. I, I use about three tons of clay a year. It's, pretty much what I've been consuming to make pots. So I, I make a lot of pots. And once in a while there's some really good ones. So some potters spend a lot of time focusing on decorating. Um, and um, I tend to work in a large body of work and once in a while I get some really nice pieces that turn out. So even if, though the clay is pre-made, I still work it up and wedge it. And this is kind of an important process for me too, um, physically, but it does, gets the clay, the air bubbles out, it gets the clay tight and um, homogenous so that there's not hard and soft spots. So about making pottery, there's quite a bit of physical effort. And I like that. It keeps me on my toes and it keeps me active. And I think that's a very good, very good thing to find a job in, your, in, in this world that keeps you happy. That's important to me. I'm still excited. I can't wait to make the next piece. This is called a Shimpo Whisper. I love it because it's it's just silent. All right, so got the clay prepared and then slam it on the wheel. A little bit of water. I'm going to try to make these into small bowls. Open it. I'm going to pinch it up. Use a little wooden tool, rib tool, and push this out. Little undercut. Take my wire and draw that tight. I don't think of myself so much as a production potter, but I do make lots of shapes that are very similar but somehow in the end I feel like they're all unique in different pieces so 
I'm not just mass producing the same thing over and over. Kind of smooth out the inside. There's a danger in making this look too easy. It's, it's taken me all these years to get to this point, so I still feel like I'm learning. I'm learning to be more efficient and make fewer mistakes. I love the, about making these smaller pieces I really love the physical activity, but it's also mental, so it's a wonderful blend of kind of a a wonderful blend of like a meditative process. So there's this kind of centering is kind of like a, a sacred moment praying maybe and and opening this and taking this raw clay and shaping it into a bowl. I just love this gesture, the kind of the dance, the movement, and to repeat it over and over again. Maybe sort of like a, a concert pianist. They've practiced years and years, decades to get to play the same song again, but this time the song is better than before. And so making these little pots is kind of like practicing the same song over and over, and hopefully you just get better and better. Just kind of pinching the clay. So here are some pieces that have uh, been made a few days before, so they're getting drier. And um, what I want to do with these pieces is what I'm kind of making these that they might be little cup holder trays that um, would, would hold a couple of small cups. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking with these little dishes. And it's important for me to sign and date my, my work. So at this point, um, sign my signature. And I like the date, 2020. What a year this has been. But sometimes I look back at pots I've made 40 years ago, and when I can see the date, it really helps me, and I can remember when I made that piece. I can remember where I was when I made the piece. So that's fun for me and maybe a hundred years from now somebody would appreciate knowing who and when the piece was made. So after these pieces are dry enough I load them in this electric kiln and you can see they're kind of stacked one on top of another. There's no glaze applied to these yet so they can tolerate um, being stacked together they're not going to get stuck together with glaze. This particular firing, the bisque firing, is generally uh, just below 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. At 1750 degrees Fahrenheit I uh, can operate the electric kilns with my little computer so I can program in here what I'm looking for and how quickly or slowly I want it to heat up. Um, so this little uh, computer helps me a great deal where it used to, in the old days you would have to wake up in the middle of the night set your alarm and come and turn a switch on a little bit keep turning it up and up and up over a long period of time this takes about 24 hours to heat up and then it takes about two days to cool down so I 
I have to allow for all that extra time it takes to fire. The first firing has to go very slowly because any moisture that's in the pots, any water turns to steam and it will just blow up into a million pieces. So um, I have to raise the heat temperature inside very, very slowly. So I've got these three electric kilns that I use primarily for the first firing, the bisque firing. So I make a lot of this shape. It's just kind of a flattened crockery vase shape. And um, these pieces, when they turn out, we'd hope for a glaze that would be something like that effect. So this piece, when I get it glazed and finished, I'm hoping it can have a variety of green colors with little crystals. So that's what will happen with that. These are like burial urns and or they are meant to become burial urns. So pottery has so many different uses. Historically a pottery ceramic burial urn was a very very important object to have. So Archaeologists will find these ancient pots and many of them have been protected in tombs because they were uh, burial urns. The dishes that were used every day for eating, they broke a long time ago. They didn't last and survive, but so many pieces that we see in the museums might be uh, related to burial or burial urns. Alright, so let me take out some of these pieces and I'll just start they're ready to be glazed so let's go ahead so the first thing I want to do is glaze the interior so I'm going to apply a white glaze a shiny white glaze that's make it easy to use and easy to clean. So now I've got a nice even coat of this shiny white glaze on the inside. Let me do a second one. I have to be kind of careful if I let this set for very long the glaze will get so thick so I have to pour it out as quickly as I can. Alright, so these two have got the white glaze on the inside. Here I have a looks just the same it's white but it's a it's more of a dry matte it's more like a gesso that you'd paint onto a, a canvas before painting um, so I'm going to plunge this down without getting it on the inside and I'm going to start to clean it off with a sponge these are just crushed pulverized minerals in water, so it's it's pretty safe and easy to use. And let that dry. You can see how quickly the bisqueware will absorb the liquid, and uh, it's almost dry now. Just in that short time, it's it's dry. And this one, plunge down and up. Okay, so now the, the next thing they do is, and it's really fun to sort of, re, sort of reveal the, the texture that I've carved in these pieces and, and wiping away that white slip, revealing the dark, darker clay beneath. Just that. So it kind of brings out the, the edges of that carved line and 
Um, as you can see in these finished pieces then the the dark clay showing through and the light places where the white slip has left it lighter. So this right away gives me a nice contrast of light and dark background. And over the top of this I'll spray on two different glazes on top of this. So even though these are all about the same, there's three layers of glaze on the outside and depending on how thick and thin each layer is will give me a wide variety of possibilities as well as where it is located in the gas kiln to in the final firing will in the the gas firing will impart a lot of variety to the finished piece okay so now these are ready and I'm going to uh, begin to spray some glaze on these two pieces to show you the process. So I'm spraying on the orange colored glaze and by spraying it on I can get it on really thin. Um, many potters will dip or pour glaze and they'll get a much thicker application and sometimes runs and drips and by spraying the glaze on I can I can avoid any kind of runs or drips and I can get it thick and thin where I want. I don't want to get it on this shiny white glaze so I'm kind of spraying it from below and that's it for the first coat on the outside for many years I fired everything that I made in wood burning kilns and in that process you burn wood and the wood ash lands on the pieces and eventually will melt and be part of the glaze. So I'm kind of glazing these now in a way similar to that effect but firing them in a gas burning kiln so it's much easier for me to fire them and more predictable and I get I lose fewer pieces. The wood firing is pretty brutal and uh, you, you can lose a lot of pieces due to accidents during the firing. So now I'm going to spray a mixture of ash, wood ash and borax kind of thick and thin in a, over the first glaze. So I don't know if you can tell very well, but there's the glaze goes from thick to thin and kind of a variation over the surface. And this combination then is what will give me the, the finished um, effect in the gas kiln. So now these are basically ready. I need to sponge off the bottom so there's no glaze on the bottom of the piece. Then they can be loaded into the next gas firing and fired and completed. So even though these two pieces have the very same glaze combination, um, the variety offers quite a, a difference in the finished glaze. Throughout my career I've made lots of bigger things that might bigger pieces that might be more in decorative pieces in expensive homes or art galleries. But now I enjoy simple little cups and bowls that I can use in my kitchen. And here's a few small cups. Um, each one is different. They're all different and similar. And each pot also I think has a good side so I I find the good side and some places are kind of quiet and then other places are more like a fresh snowstorm has just fallen or there's some water cascading over some ridges and so I need to have the quiet places in between and um, some are a little taller and some curve in and some curve out and um, I just love the variety, the endless variety that I can get um, 
just by making lots of little cups and not thinking too hard about it just going through this um, motion of trimming them so all of these pieces after they're thrown on the wheel have a trimmed foot and in the process of trimming that foot I trim and shave a little clay off the side wall so these are a little different than throwing marks and the, the trimming gives them a sharper edge which breaks the glaze a little better than if it was a throwing mark actually during the process of shaping the original throwing that line can be a little soft and not as um, crisp and then one stands out is totally different than the rest of them and just one band in the center it kind of tips in and meets this thicker band which relates to the rim and simple little designs I used to try so hard to make nice designs and now just um, making lots of pieces and, and hoping that the process will produce some nice pieces these bowls also were all glazed similar but yet everyone has a different sort of sometimes it reminds me of a landscape or it suggests a landscape or just a nice variety of light and dark So my life's work has been, looking back on it, has just been about making simple cups and bowls and plates over and over and over again. And ton, tons of cups and bowls and plates, enough to have uh, had a fine life. I was able to, we paid for our house, all our bills are paid, I raised two children, and have had a real nice life. And so um, it's possible you can become a, an artist or even a potter and if you work hard and um, try to be the best you can, you can have a nice life. You can be self-employed and set your own hours. I can get up and work when I want. Um, I can hardly resist, though. I like to make things. And But the world needs art. The same as we need doctors and lawyers, we need to have artists to help us see the creativity of our humankind and so I challenge you to think about a career as an artist certainly not going to be easy but if that's something that you find you enjoy doing I tell you it's been a lot of fun for me it's taken me around the world I've been able to use my my skills and abilities to teach pottery classes in other countries and travel around, go to museums and look at the pottery. Now my parents weren't very supportive of becoming a, an artist and that's probably true in most families you want your children to be happy and successful and and how could that happen as an artist but it, it truly can and um, if you work hard, put your mind to it, and you strive to be in the top 10% in your field, you'll be successful. So you just have to convince yourself, I'm only going to do this, but I'm only going to be the best I can be, and you will succeed. If you're just doing it um, halfway, then it might be a bigger struggle. But I enjoy all the aspects of pottery making. I enjoy the, the physical part of shaping and making, and the business part of actually marketing your work and selling it. That's an exciting time, really, to, to have somebody give you money for something you have made in exchange for money is, is such a, a joy. Um, so, in addition to taking the pieces fresh out of the kiln, finished pieces, the, the moment of transaction when a, a stranger or a friend comes to purchase a piece that you've made and offers you money in exchange is, is like the ultimate compliment of 
what you're trying to do with your life and um, it's wonderful. I, I just can't imagine um, being cooped up in, a, in an office room all day every day but being a potter or being an artist has in, given me the opportunity for so many uh, exciting experiences that I probably wouldn't have had otherwise. I began my pottery career uh, or my pottery with uh, as a junior in college at Luther College and um, after two years of learning how to make pottery at Luther College I thought I knew everything there was to to know and the teacher there the instructor was kind of like now you know you just go out and do it and you'll be successful well I did that for a couple of years and a friend of mine said, come and visit the University of Iowa. So I went to the University of Iowa and for two years and learned at a big institution from different teachers who had totally different directions from what I first had learned. So I almost had to unlearn everything and relearn it a different way. And that's important that you take advantage of your teachers. And when you go and have a new teacher, Take advantage of them. Don't like discard them and say, well, I already know this stuff, but be open to new ideas. Um, it's really important to always consider yourself a student for your whole life. Just be the student. Don't assume that you know everything. So I went to the University of Iowa, and then I um, was accepted into graduate school at Wichita State University, and where I received my master's. MFA in ceramics, and that allowed me to teach, which um, opened many, many doors. So I have been a college professor for 20 years, a total of 20 years, at the University of Florida, and actually uh, seven years total back at Luther College where I first began, which was really fun. So it's fun. Half of my career I've been able to teach, and of course if you ever think about teaching, we need teachers so badly, and when you do teach, act as a teacher then you learn so much more because you've got to answer all the questions that the students will have and you need to know your material very well so being a teacher is is like the next step of learning I always felt still that I was a student even though I was a teacher I learned so much more than when I was a student so um, graduate school is a really good idea if you're going to become an artist, it will give you a big advantage over other people. And, of course, then I've been a studio potter, artist, a studio artist for 25 years, and that's enabled me to travel to art fairs, mostly doing art fairs, work in galleries, workshops around the country, and um, teaching experiences around the world. So it, it's been a wonderful career for me so far. And I don't have to retire. Sometimes you get to be 65 years old and your boss will say, you're retired. Thanks for your, your work. But I don't have to retire. So as a self-employed artist, you don't have to stop. So that's a, a real big gift, actually, that I can keep doing this as long as I can. And um, what a great opportunity.